What happens when you put two experts behind mics to match wits on the current state of financial services, the economy, investments, and more? From the American College of Financial Services, this is Wealth Managed. Welcome to Wealth Managed. I'm Michael Finca. I'm a professor of wealth management at the American College. And I'm David Blanchett, head of retirement research at PGM, which is the investment management group of Prudential. And we are here today with Azish Falabi. She is the executive director of the American College McGuire Center for Ethics. And today we're going to talk about ethics. Azish, what is ethics? Thank you, Michael. And thank you, David, for having me here today. Looking forward to this conversation. So I like to categorize ethics into two broad categories. Of course, they will overlap, but the broad categories are personal ethics. So personal ethical dilemmas in business, you know, those are the the ones that relate to your personal decision-making processes and how it reflects who you want to be in the world on a day-to-day basis. And then there's institutional ethics. These are about the structural aspects of the organizations. This includes things like compensation models, corporate governance, board models, and all of the systems that go into making up an organization. So it's not to suggest that you should have a different ethical value at work than what you have at home. But if you're a leader in an organization, your personal ethics and the choices that you make do have an institutional impact at the company. So with both of these broad categories, it's important, I think, to bring a systems lens to ethics. And we can talk about what that means. You know, I think fundamentally, some people will say that ethics is about how you were raised and what your family values are. And while I think that how you're raised is an important component of your ethics, it's not only about how you were raised. So it's not good enough to be a good person. We need to create environments and good systems to support ethical behavior on a day-to-day basis. And so for those of you who are students of behavioral science and behavioral finance, there's a subfield called behavioral ethics. And that's how I like to define ethics. As we think about the systems one and systems two thinking, this is Daniel Kahneman's work for which you won a Nobel Prize. Systems one is our automatic response. This is where our biases live. It's a reflective and intuitive response to our situations. And this is often where ethics lives. Systems two, of course, is where the reasoning happens. It's where we slow down and think about the rational decisions that we make. And ethics, unfortunately, doesn't usually fall into that category. So ethical people will make unethical decisions based on their context. And not all people every time will, of course, make a poor decision in a tough situation. But ethics is a muscle. And putting the same person in different contexts and environments, particularly where there's social and financial pressure, will mean that people need to work harder to exercise their muscles. And ultimately, that's what ethics and ethical decision making is about. Well, Azish, that that almost seems a little squishy. So it seems like everybody might have their own definition of what is ethical and what is not. And I'm thinking in my mind that is ethics a willingness to do what is in the best interest of others? Is it a willingness to follow a specific code that you adhere to, a set of values, for example, that your institution might have? I really want to drill down to, you say it's a muscle, but what is that muscle doing? How is it responding to a stimulus? What is guiding that response? So how do I build up a muscle of ethical behavior if it is so subjective? It is a reflective response to your situation and your circumstance. And when I think about the way you're asking the question in terms of willingness, it makes me think that there is a rational choice involved in in all circumstances. And I think the challenge is that ethics is about being other oriented. And when is that muscle kicking in for you to be other oriented versus self-interested, right? So from that perspective, if it helps to make make it a little less squishy, it is about the decisions that you're making that will impact others and how you're approaching that decision-making process. Codes of conduct actually don't demonstrate that there's a lot of value in them when it comes to ethical decision-making. In one ear, out the other. It doesn't seem to really stick. But what does matter is the behavior of those around you. Social influence actually has a big impact on how you're making ethical decisions on a day-to-day basis. And so it's about the, again, the systems lens and the cultural and social context um, and the influences that are put on you in order to make you work that muscle in the right way. You know, to use Michael's very technical term, squishy, ethics is about perception as well, right? So you could be doing things that you perceive are ethical or others might, but others wouldn't. Doing something that hurts one person 
but it helps many people, right? Based upon your code of how you respond to situations, you might not be willing to hurt one person to save many, but others would. How would you define that as ethical or unethical? To me, it's the, it seems inherently squishy and therefore ethics can be very difficult to define in very different situations. Absolutely. No, I completely agree with that. And it takes me back to the classic trolley dilemma in philosophy and ethics. And there are no absolute right answers in certain circumstances, right? Where there are certain trade-offs that need to be made. And therefore it does leave ethics in a, a squishy gray area when we're at the extremes. And I think in most business situations, we're not at the extremes. Often we're actually in norms that have been created through patterns of behavior from our predecessors, from regulatory systems and the leaders in the organizations that have created a certain practice of business. And it's within those norms that people are trying to make a decision that's consistent with their own personal values, with how they think that they were raised and who they want to be in the world. But they're fighting against systems that are encouraging them to sell in a certain way, or to be able to develop products in a certain way that are cutting too many corners and therefore leading to some of these scandals that we might see down the line years later that started very small with certain choices that were being made within the organization. So I think when you're talking about institutional ethics, what makes an ethical institution and what makes an unethical institution? Obviously, we see these institutions that seem to get into trouble time after time, and then we see other institutions that seem to be good at staying the course. We meet people from different institutions and they tend to exhibit the same sort of culture. How do you develop a culture like that, an ethical culture in an institution? I think one of the most important factors of developing that type of culture, Michael, is to be very intentional about it. You know, you can't just set it and forget it when it comes to ethics. You really have to be proactive about designing an institutional system that includes your processes for hiring people, circumstances where you might fire people for having breached a certain value or norm, assessing your culture and understanding where people are today vis-a-vis what you believe your corporate values are, setting up your reward systems and your compensation systems. I mean, compensation is often at the heart of all decision-making and certainly ethical decision-making, making sure there's transparency around that and the communication systems are in place, It's all about having a deliberate and cohesive approach to thinking about organizational design and designing an ethical system from the outset and then monitoring it. You know, a lot of times ethics is about the people and the leaders and how they are operating on a day-to-day basis, yet we don't necessarily approach the people problem the same way we might approach a financial challenge within an organization. And what I mean by that is that we think that people might be completely irrational and they're going to do what they're going to do. But thankfully, we don't have any bad apples here. And the truth is, you don't really know until you actually assess your system and try to understand whether you have situations that might encourage your good apples to take certain steps that will go down the slippery slope to a wrong result. So it's really important to be proactive about your system's design and to monitor it the same way you would monitor any other organizational system that relates to products that you might have or other aspect of your business. So what are your thoughts generally on kind of ethics in the financial services industry? I mean, you know, how does it apply to business models? Just any thoughts there? One of the biggest challenges of ethics in the industry, I think, is around silos, actually. And this might be a a counterintuitive response to to that question, David. But let's look back to the financial crisis, for instance, where there were a lot of decisions being made within silos at various parts of the organization. But there wasn't a broad umbrella view on what was going on and how risk is being managed across an organization how it impacts the clients, the consumers, other stakeholders. And then, of course, we know that risk was bought, packaged, and sold to other entities within the system. So how are we thinking about risk from a systemic level? I think about all of those as ethical decisions, because in the first instance, you might be making a sale that seems fine for the customer at that time. But if you're working just in a silo, then you're not necessarily thinking about the big picture. And that's going to lead to ethics risk for the entire industry down the line. And what we're seeing is that, you know, from a reputational perspective and a consumer trust in the system perspective, there's the issue of contagion within the industry. 
What I mean by that is that if there are a couple of firms that are bad actors, then it ends up really impacting trust and confidence in the entire system. And I think that's an ethical dilemma for all of us to consider as leaders within the industry and how we can help manage it. We'll take a break here. We'll be right back. Give your clients the retirement security they need with our Retirement Income Certified Professional designation. Visit theamericancollege.edu slash RICP to learn more. Learn how a goal-based approach redefines 21st century investment with our Wealth Management Certified Professional designation. Bring your value to a new level at theamericancollege.edu slash WMCP. Welcome back. You know, when we think about in financial planning in particular, there's a lot of potential conflicts of interest. Everybody has a potential conflict, no matter how you construct compensation or how you design products, there's always going to be an angle where you can generate more revenue. I'll just give you as an example, the traditional asset under management model of compensation, a lot of people who use that form of compensation consider themselves more ethical than other forms of compensation. But one of the reasons that works is because it is so opaque. A lot of times people don't know how much they're paying for financial advice. And then you have other advisors who say, well, that's a problem. That's unethical. You need to tell people, you need to charge people by the hour or charge them by the plan. That's a more ethical approach to financial planning. I mean, is it ethical to accept a business model that works because of, for example, a lack of consumer information? Let me give another example. So let's say you're an insurance company and you're designing a product and it is profitable because people who use the product don't use it optimally. So let's say they don't take income when they should or they lapse the product. Is that an ethical product design when you know that it works because of some sort of a deficiency on the part of a consumer. So a conflict of interest is a circumstance where you owe duties to more than one person. So let's say it's two people, it's you owe a, a duty to your clients and often in certain circumstances might be in the best interest of your clients. And you also owe a duty to your firm or perhaps you believe you owe duty to yourself in terms of how you're being compensated, right? So you're motivated by often a material trade-off and you can't necessarily advance both interests with one decision. And so we do see that with certain models, it can motivate advisors to give incrementally worse advice. And there's research done around the subject. Uh, Professor Sunita saw who's a professor at Cornell. She's one of the experts in financial advice and conflicts of interest. And she has found that consistently advisors provide inferior advice when they are motivated to be financially better off as a result of that inferior advice. Of course, our regulatory systems tolerate conflicted advice. So this creates a question around what is the norm within the industry and how do we think about personal ethical decision-making in a context where the norm is to provide conflicted advice? And how do we think about the systems in the financial advisory sector where you have an entire business model that allows and tolerates conflicted advice? Having said that, there is an opportunity for personal ethical decisions in each circumstance. There are some consumers that might truly benefit from a certain product. And on a case-by-case -case basis, it is the job of a financial advisor to be able to, to find those consumers, or at least recognize the consumer when they're interacting with them, and to be, at a minimum, transparent. I think ethics is about transparency in those relationships, so that the, the client understands where what they're getting, how it's benefiting them, and circumstances where it might not benefit them. And unfortunately, I don't see that the, the current industry is consistently set up to enable agents and advisors to do that. <laughs> I mean, Michael touched on this, right? And I think, you know, one of the, the things that I've gotten into a few times is this idea of, right, there's obviously different ways advisors can charge for their services. And, you know, I don't know that necessarily some are inherently unethical and some are ethical, but part of me feels like there could be like a spectrum of ethicalness, if that's a word. And I didn't know if you would thought about that in the context of, you know, as we're evolving as a profession, do you perceive the industry potentially moving towards newer models of compensation or different models that exist currently to kind of improve the ethics and maybe reduce those conflicts? You know, I wish I had the magic bullet answer for this. You know, it's a challenge for a lot of professions, I will say. 
I myself was trained as a lawyer and lawyers get paid by the hour, right? So you um, often find some lawyers litigating cases that probably should have never gone as far as they did. And they get a lot of benefit from having charged a lot of hours with those clients. So you get the system that you design for. So I agree with you, David. I think there is, there is a, a spectrum and you can see that you know, in studies after studies will show where there are compensation systems. Actually, I think you have a study relating to this, David, where there's a compensation system that will demonstrate that if you're rewarding people for, for commissions and sales, you're going to get more sales from your um, agents. And if you're rewarding people for assets under management, you're going to see increased assets under management. That's the system that was designed. You hired people to fulfill those duties and they have a duty to you to fulfill them. So it shouldn't really be a surprise to see that people are acting consistent with the conflicts that the system was designed for. I think the harder question is how do we design a rewarding financial system that enables people to get the education and advice that they need as consumers to be able to make effective financial choices for themselves and their family while rewarding the professionals for the hard work that they do to provide advice. And I think that's a question that we all as an industry and as a professional group need to, to grapple with and, and come up with the right answer from a system design perspective. To your point, you know, advisors are going to get paid, right? And people need help. I think to me, there's just that grand question of what that structure should look like. And then how much should advisors charge for a given service or product, right? And how transparent are they being as part of that process? I think that, you know, there's a whole body of research around the effectiveness of disclosures. And everyone knows that no one reads disclosures, even the shorter disclosures, even if it's two page, oftentimes people don't read them, or if they do read them, they don't know how to put it in the context of the transaction they're in. And they don't know how it impacts the transaction that, that they're engaging in. So I think there's a broader question in terms of how that transparency works. And can we really have informed consents around some of these situations to make sure that people are getting the best advice that they need and paying fairly for it? You know, Azish, there are some things that bother me about this industry. And I think that, as you mentioned before, if I'm an advisor, I'm going to respond to the incentives of the business model that I operate within. And my job and my boss's job are to maximize profits for the company that I work for. So I am inevitably going to face these issues where what is good for the company and the shareholders is different than what is good for the individual client. And I have to come to some sort of a balance between what's good for my company and what is good for the client. But if I fall too far in the direction of the client, I'm not going to have a job. I'm not going to be as successful. I will get fired. And in fact, is it an advantage to be less ethical in the marketplace or does the arc in the marketplace fall towards more ethical behavior? Or is it a problem really of regulation that when you open up the possibility for unethical behavior, you essentially create these incentives for people to be unethical and it's only the unethical that survive? That is a fantastic question. I too am troubled by certain trends in industry and business. I do think that we are seeing, particularly with some of what's going on in the ESG space, right? Environmental, social, and governance investing that over the long term, companies that are able to demonstrate that they're more ethical are doing better. And I hesitate around the ESG conversation just because there, there's evidence of some greenwashing and it's a bit complicated. But I think that in financial services, particularly in the financial advisory space, one factor that works for more ethical business design is the importance of trust in the relationship. And that with so many leaders, when you talk to them about one of the core values that they have for their company, it's around trust because they recognize that without trust, it's not possible to do business over the long term. And again, with the issue of contagion, it's an industry level question of whether people have trust in financial services overall and how that affects their willingness to engage in what I think is the second factor in response to your question, which is the repeated interactions that are necessary to be able to engage with an advisor that you trust and believe is ethical. And in the long run, I do think that pays off. But 
I also don't want to be naive about the fact that there are opportunities for some companies to be able to have short-term profit if they cut corners. So I think that the, the regulatory question that comes into play, Michael, is to be able to have an enforcement system that is able to pick up on the short-term nature of those companies and individuals who have taken advantage and that they're taken out of the system much easier said than done. And I think that the challenge for the ethical companies is to be able to demonstrate their ethics, continue to retain their clients, and be able to manage that business for the long term. So Azish, I think what you're saying is that if this is a recurring relationship, there is actually an incentive to act ethically because your customer is more likely to come back, but there may be short run incentives to take advantage, in which case there are short term benefits, but that can cost an institution in the long run. Well, thank you, Azish, for joining us today. It was a great conversation. It was my pleasure. Thank you both for having me on. Thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Finca. I'm David Blanchett. See you later. For more episodes and shows, visit theamericancollege.edu slash podcasts. Wealth Managed is a production of the American College of Financial Services. 